I'm a singer, a songwriter, and a music producer. I travel around the world with my music, but Singapore is where I call home. It's a small place, but there's so much for me to learn about this tiny island and all it has to offer. You've walked down the rail corridor. You've explored Pulau Ubin. But I bet you didn't know about these gems in nature. In this season of Show Me the City, I'm going to have a ball of a time playing. Release slowly. You need to catch that wind so that you can breathe. I'm going to make a robot dog. Hello. Get some own moments. Oh. Looks like a big responsibility. A big job for a big guy. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate a bit of culture. You can't find a lot of towels outside here. They built this as a swimming pool for the military usage. And get all futuristic. This is basically that mimics the mucus of the future plant. It's often said that children only have one job, and that is to play. But why let kids have all the fun? We should all enjoy play for the rest of our lives. Here's my plan. I'm going to turn the nature in Singapore into my giant play box. And here's how I'll do it. We know this place as Turf City, but for 66 years, this was the Bukit Timah race course, where thousands of hopefuls filled the stands for their chance at riches. Today, however, I'm headed there, where a finishing line of a very different kind awaits. Bringing out my wild side is Tim, whose calling in life is to get kids outdoors. His team has created an obstacle course right here in the forest. The pit is, we like to describe it as a military-style obstacle course. We've used the terrain, used the flora, and we've put in our own little man-made obstacles, such as a rope swing, an A-frame, a monkey bars up that end, and we've made use of this river. I'm going to get very, very muddy. OK, guys, can I get a show of hands? Who has been in the pit before? Who is completely new to the pit? Is anybody a little bit scared? OK. Don't worry, all the children that came out alive will die. Mostly, mostly. But what, but what about the adults? About <laughs> all the kids came out alive. They never say anything about the adults. I wish I shared the enthusiasm of some of these little warriors. At least I'm not going at this alone. I'm teammates with Pitt veteran Koki and sisters Sharan and Rian, fellow newbies like myself. Woo! Good job. Hey, Daniel, you're going to do the big boy loop. <laughs> Woo! Three, two, one, go. One, one two, two, three, four. Can we, can we two, on the sand? One. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> We have had tens of thousands of kids come through here. But it's all about getting people back out into nature and enjoying learning about themselves. What can they do? Can they do the monkey bars? Are they frightened of being in the water or not? You know, some kids can be a little bit apprehensive about natural stuff. You can do it. You can do it. So it's about removing that metaphoric cotton wool layer. Certainly these days, there is much more of a protective element. We want to remove that. Ah, it's very wet. I don't like this. I don't like this one bit. Ah, it's soggy. The tree tried to kill me. Ah. If he's cheating, shout cheat. <laughs> <laughs> Hard work. <laughs> The lush forest surrounding our obstacles didn't always look like this. It was once a very manicured part of the racetrack, where horses were brought down for exercise, and even a swim. When we took over, which was about 2003, the vegetation was far lower, and you could actually see from one side of the ravine to the other side. Obviously, over time, we've let it grow. 
and we've had Nature Society of Singapore do a very detailed and very interesting report on this whole area with regard to a rare species, uh, endangered species. They've uncovered a number of rare species of flora and they've observed uh, very rare birds. I love this because it means that people, humans coming through here, nature has coexisted. So this is called shipwrecked. So you were all on a ship and then you're bobbing around in the ocean. You're on a little piece of debris and you're sinking. So you have to get your whole team up the ladder across the shipwreck to the nice rescue boat over there. But you have to be quick because there's a storm coming. Can you feel that? Oh. Do you think there's a storm coming? I think there might be. Come on, Daniel. Yes. The storm is coming. Save yourselves. <laughs> Koki has left you. Go on without me. <laughs> a little bit of effort. Come on. I have found peace. Rule. Rule for my life. Oh, I, <laughs> I have sunk to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. I can do it. There's a burst of energy. I feel it. I feel it. Cheer him on. Cheer him on. He's your teammate. Come on, Daniel. Come on, Daniel. I yes. I made it. Boat. Where are you going? Yay, he made it. <laughs> OK, you're nearly halfway. You're doing well. I have never done anything like this in my life. During my national service, I was injured, so I didn't get to go through that obstacle course. So my first time, instead of being with soldiers, I was with kids, and I still got destroyed. Come on, the party's not over. Come on. <laughs> I'm no longer used to playing like this. <sighs> Why do you think the adults struggle more than the kids? Uh, apprehension. <laughs> I think they probably know what's ahead of it. The older and wiser and have been through this before, whereas kids are in their learning stage. They have no fear, and it's discovery. It's for them, it's adventure. Go! <laughs> I'm jealous of how adventurous the kids are. With all my injuries and life experience, I've got hurt many times. So now I'm this cautious old man who's afraid to do a lot of things, while the kids are just jumping in head first, just flying around these courses and just having so much fun. While I still still finding my groove, still warming up, and even at the end, I don't think I really found my groove, but they were having so much fun. I'm tired, I'm muddy, I'm soggy. I need a shower. Guys, are you <sighs> tired? No. Hey guys, which was your favorite part of today? Washing up. <laughs> Washing up. <laughs> the mudslide. The mudslide. You were you were eager to go first every time. <laughs> I like climbing, like the monkey bars and the ladder. I think what's nice is that indoors we can't experience this kind of natural stuff, and at the pit we can experience like the mud, the soil. <laughs> I was struggling to keep up with you guys. You guys, you guys were breezing through every obstacle. Because you're young. It's because you're young. It's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> Up next, I move from the wild to the extremely delicate. I'm someone with zero artistic capability when it comes to drawing or painting. There's a hole. Meet Carlos. Kite flying is a form of childhood play he's still holding on to, but he's an oddity in the kite flying community. While others go big, he goes small. His specialty is micro kites of insects and animals. How many micro kites do you think you've made now? Um, about 100. 100? Yeah, about 10 kites per year. Do you have a favorite style of micro kites? For me, I love butterfly because there's a lot of species of butterfly in the world. A different type of colour, the vibrant colour, make it so uh, challenging to do it. Uh, this is one of my favourite kite because of the colour, the blue colour mixed with the yellow, orange, this makes it very, very nice. This one's like really lifelike. 
if I saw this like just hanging on a tree or something, I'll think this is a real butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> Not only do they look really lifelike, they are just as light too. For micro cut, you need to be very light. We will say less than one gram will make it perfect for a micro cut. Mm. This is a peacock butterfly. Then you can see there's a sub here compared to all the other kites, which is an round edge. This looks really hard to make. Oh, how about I teach you how to do it? Yeah, sure. Mm, sure. Is it going to take me like one month to make one of these? Mm, no, I can teach you something which you can make in, within a day. Within a day? Yep. Let's do it. Mm, come. Today, I'm going to teach you to make a mini kite. <laughs> Quite easy to do it. No easy worry. to do. I yeah. thought we were going to do butterflies. I saw so many butterflies. No, butterfly, unless you're willing to stay with me for one month to learn <laughs> the skill. <laughs> <laughs> to make my very first tiny kite, I start to colour this ultra flimsy plastic surface to my heart's content. Child's play, or is it? Because this is a permanent marker, after that, your hand will be full of marker ink. But that's the fun of making a kite. If this was gold, I would be a James yeah. Bond villain. Goldfinger. Do you feel he looks like a Peter? Peter? I'm going to call him Peter. He feels like a Peter to me. <laughs> I always kind of feel bigger is better. But for kites, is that the case? Big kite, you need bigger airspace to do it. I have a kiss then. I don't have much time to go out. So... That forced me to switch from the big kite to the small kite. I can even fly it just downstairs, uh, void tech, without going far away. When you fly a kite, right, you feel your own mind. And you go down to a big tree, just look up. Look at the canopy, look at the silhouette of the leaf and the branches. You will feel a sense of nature coming to you. So I accidentally completely butchered the first wing and it was very stressful because I'm trying to do a good job. Bakal showed me it's okay if it's rough around the edges, it's okay if the colours aren't super consistent because things like that happen in nature. Like it's not a perfectly symmetrical thing. This is just a fun way to play and express yourself. The next step we're going to do the very important thing is do the structure of the kite. For doing the structure you need to use what? Bamboo. We use the heat, right, to, to bend it. Oh, oh, oh it broken. Broke. Yeah. I broke it. This is a lot harder than it looks because it requires a lot of delicacy. You have to imagine what the end product is and be very delicate and very precise so you get a smooth curve or a smooth edge. I'm not very delicate. I tend to break things quite a lot. So this is where my patience must come through. <laughs> this is almost like making it like a hair kind of thickness. It's really quite cool. How do you know when it's thin enough? Feel it using your heart. Using your heart. No, still, still need some work. <laughs> because of the size, right? You need to be very precise on the proportion. Both sides must be balanced or, or else or you will just wobbly around and it just fall down on the ground. Okay, now we are going to cut the kite out. For micro cut, everything must be beside. The thing must be fine, the more sharpened one, so I'm using a surgical knife. Are you the only micro kite maker in Singapore? From what I know, right, Singapore we have about five kite maker. For butterfly micro kite, I'm the only one. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm learning from the best. Soon there will be six card makers in Singapore. Oh, yes. Slowly, slowly, yeah? Huh? Yes, okay. Oh. Peter has come to life. It's not that bad. I have bad news. What? There is a hole. Where? Right here. Carlos, I don't have the magic. I have the magic. You can save Peter? Yeah, I can save Peter. It's time for some emergency room surgery. In the process of making kite or flying a kite, right, we always uh, have hole here, broken bone there. Then we need to learn how to patch back, how to repair it. That's it. There it is. Peter the owl kite all patched up and ready. Last thing to do, weighing. 
to see if Peter makes the cut as a microkite. At 0.28 grams, he does. Then it's time for takeoff. Just so pull up. Uh, when you release, uh, release slowly. Uh, you need to catch the wind so that you can breathe. I believe in you. I believe in you, Peter. Yes. <laughs> Unlike normal kites, micro ones don't soar high up into the sky. They hover gently in the air, close to you. I had my doubts whether this would fly, because during the process of making it, I made a lot of mistakes. But it flew, and I'm pretty impressed with myself. Oh, your kites look very balancing. Mm, nice. Mm, nice. Nice and balanced. Yes. As a kid, I never had this experience of flying a kite, but it was a great way for me to feel young again and play in nature. Next up, I'm about to experience fun of a very different kind. Was that, like, I just saw something white above my head in the trees, and I was not ready for that adventure. To play in nature is to be entertained and to be stimulated by nature. To me, that's chillaxing by the beach or taking a walk in the park. But there are other forms of play too, like at night, in the dark, in the wild. Ivan is a professional nature guide who is leading me to brave our wild with a night trek. Bukit Batok Nature Park is one of the few fairly forested parks where people are still able to visit at night to walk around, look for nocturnal wildlife. So along the stream, you might get things like fishes, frogs, especially in the forested areas, you might even get things like prawns and freshwater crabs living in, in this kind of small waterways. I've never like seen a small stream like this All right, in yeah. Singapore. When people go off the trails, they can end up coming across other animals that do not like being stepped on. For instance, the most minor ones, ants. More major ones, you get things like snakes. There might even be a wild boar sleeping somewhere in the bushes and then it gets disturbed and that's when people have a high chance of getting hurt. A walk in the wild at night gives me the chance to see nocturnal creatures which are usually resting in the day. And the fact that us humans can't see very well in the dark actually adds to the thrill. I feel like a kid on an adventure. It's kind of spooky. Hey, it's a mother and baby Kologo. Where the baby at? Okay, so you can see it on the left side of this Kologo. So this is an animal that's only found in Southeast Asia. All right, this uh, is the Malayan Kolugo, okay, and uh, they're actually quite commonly seen in Bukit Batok Nature Park, right? Um, they are gliding mammals. It is actually on its own unique group of mammals, quite closely related to primates, which means that they're actually quite closely related to human beings and monkeys and apes. How do you see these things? I'm walking with one thing, you're spoiling like six other animals. <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> it's experience and a lot, of, a lot of nights spent in the forest. What made you become a nature guide? I grew up with a passion for animals. And then as I grew older, I wanted to make a difference by sharing what we can find here in Singapore and by getting people to care more, to learn more about how Singapore, despite being so urbanised, is still home to such rich biodiversity. And hopefully, through this uh, awareness, we're able to do more to make Singapore not just a great place for the urban environment, but also a safe haven for all the wildlife that can find here in our midst. It didn't take me long to do my bit of wildlife spotting too. What's that? What? Chicken. What? Where? Tree chicken. Where? Tree oh. chicken. Hey. Okay. I didn't you, see that just now. You sneaky. <laughs> you sneaky chicken you. 
okay. Shh, let's not disturb him. He's I got, sleeping. I was scared. Like I just saw something white above my head in the trees, and I was not ready for that adventure. Under Ivan's lead, I'm learning to keep my eyes peeled and my ears open. You can hear the owl right now, right? So um, that's a smaller owl called the Sundas Cops owl. Actually, quite a common and widespread species in Singapore. So uh, very cute, all right? Only about this big. So let's see what else you can find over here. Ooh. If the it owl is, suddenly attacks you, it, 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 it responds. It's, it's to not me. My, my problem. So you can hear this is um, the symphony of the night. So are these cicadas? No, cicadas usually call during the daytime. Ah. Crickets are the night shift. Ah. Right? What I found was that I actually really enjoyed listening to what was around me. It was a real nice sense of peace, but also excitement because it's so many unknown sounds. I kind of found myself like connecting with my inner child and being really playful around here. Every sound was a new sound, every smell was a new smell, every sight a new sight. And I think that's something that, you know, if I didn't experience today, I don't think I would have reconnected with myself like that. When I stepped in there, I felt like I was transported to another world. I felt like my senses were heightened. I felt I was more attuned to what was going on around me. I'm used to the nightlife in Singapore. Not this kind of nightlife, but I could get used to it. The wind, the water, the earth. We connect with these elements of nature more deeply when we play in them. And these are experiences I've not had before. I've learned to let go of my apprehension when pitting my body against the elements. Be more appreciative of the wild in the city and let my spirit soar, especially when I'm bringing something I made to life in the wind. But you know what the best part is? There's so much more in nature that I'm gonna play in and I can't wait.